So tell me something about your podcast or whatever it is you're doing. I started my YouTube channel seven months ago now. It was in the midst of, um, well, the pandemic and yes. like the Black Lives Matter riots and whatnot. And I remember seeing on Facebook all of my friends calling each other names and stuff and people just writing these monologue posts about, you know, these people are terrible and all that. And it's just like mm -hmm. that bothered me. And I was internally angry. And the first couple of videos I posted were mostly just me kind of venting almost and just saying, right. like, these are my thoughts, all that stuff. But I've always been interested in, um, I don't know. I mean, like politics, abstract kind of ideas. And now that I've done this more and I'm getting more into the actual finer details, talking to someone like you, mm -hmm. um, the, the approach I'm coming from is sort of a, it's like a mental health focus mm -hmm. um, and then trying to integrate any abstract idea down to, well, how could this benefit an individual's mental health? What, you know, um, what value does it have for an individual person? So um, we talked on the phone. I am a, yes, a huge Jordan Peterson fan. Um, fan, maybe reductive. I should find a different word, an adherent, maybe. It sounds a little okay. more sophisticated. Um, but um, yeah, and, and Jung is a big inspiration for him. Um, and I, I, the single author I've read the most of is Jung. And I've got um, Man in the Symbols here. Um, and I, because I've got something that I want to ask you straight from there. Um, and just because I've read them doesn't mean I understand them. So yeah, do you, do you have the hardbound copy of Man and the Symbols? This one? No, you have the small one. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, well, all right. Um, you're on your you're on your way. Yes, <laughs> is what I can tell you. Right. Right. So, and it's it's I'm I I'm also very interested. I, I think I ha I think I lean in that in between um not fully like i have friends that are very much more i would say artistically minded creative open-minded more into the abstract philosophy mm -hmm. and then i have friends who are more on the engineering business side of things and i like <clears throat> to think i occupy that middle ground so like my favorite thing is when and jordan peterson does this a lot is when you can synthesize like a very specific biological or scientific phenomenon and then connect it to the abstract you know hey that this 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 axiom in philosophy states this and here's here's the neurobiology that basically is exactly in line with that and i think like the whole idea of archetypes i think fits that middle ground perfectly and i know one of the things that um that i was i've seen it twice now on your channel um you mentioned there's a passage about jung rectifying sort of science and religion by pointing out you can replace the word unconscious with god uh, Christ with self, individuation with salvation. And it's like right. that, to me, that is so, that's like yeah. forefront type uh, intellectual. Um, yep. I have endeavors. that quote right here. <laughs> yes. Yes. So that, that when, when I, I, um, it was the sleeping gods podcast. I don't know the gentleman's name is an Irish guy or it's like Adam oh, or yeah. something. Yeah. I, I remember. Yeah. He had a clip and I <clears> saved <throat> that clip just because that's so, exceedingly interesting but um but yeah so um i think we can get started there's one um let me pull up the passage so yeah skip so like i was saying um you know i'm coming from things from like a mental health perspective i'm very interested in anxiety and panic attacks and things of like the intersection where people have, you know, existential dread and lack of meaning and, you know, fear in life. And then where that intersects with how does that manifest in their behavior or in moments of, you know, falling apart, like a panic attack or something like that. And in preparation for this, I was going through man and his symbols and I, I cause I wanted to look up what, I, where I had annotated to ask you some questions. And there was a, the one passage in this book that when I read it, it stuck in my mind. And I, I forgot where it was and I hadn't opened this in, you know, six, seven months. So I opened it and the very first page, it showed up on page 31. And so I want to read you this passage and get your thoughts. Um, this is Jung. 
I have more than once been consulted by well-educated and intelligent people who've had peculiar dreams, fantasies, or even visions, which have shocked them deeply. They have assumed that no one who is in a sound state of mind could suffer from such things and that anyone who actually sees a vision must be pathologically disturbed. A theologian once told me that Ezekiel's visions were nothing more than morbid symptoms and that when Moses and other prophets heard voices speaking to them, they were suffering from hallucinations. You can imagine the panic he felt when something of this kind spontaneously happened to him. We are so accustomed to the apparently rational nature of our world that we can scarcely imagine anything happening that cannot be explained by common sense. The primitive man, confronted by a shock of this kind, would not doubt his sanity. He would think of fetishes, spirits, or gods. So to me, that's very interesting because I, I and I discussed this with a, a friend of mine on a different podcast, is like, we live in a world where we don't, you know, we've kind of abandoned religion, we've abandoned God, we're putting everything through a materialist, rationalist lens. So when people have crazy dreams or, you know, just breaks from reality, the only description is, well, I must be mentally ill. I must be in a DSM diagnostic category or something. And that's um, absolutely not true. Right, right. And I want right. to get your thoughts. And I know just, I know you talked about, um, you were you were possessed by an anima or the anima for a yes. period of time. And then yes. you've also had visions with, uh, is it Mephistopheles, right? Oh, so yes. anything yeah. in that, yes. That was I'd be my curious favorite. To know your <laughs> yes, right, so... <laughs> Well, uh, let me first say that um, the part of your psyche that is the boss is the self, okay? It's not your ego, okay? It's the self in Jung's context, which he also calls the greater personality or uh, the God image. Now, that self has developed for the last three and a half billion years, um, since life itself began. And what it has done is it has made it possible for you and I to have a conversation now, okay? Because um, every one of our ancestors going back three and a half billion years, and we all have them that far back, um, every single one of them did two things successfully. They survived until they reproduced, okay? Now, most of those ancestors uh, did not have um, consciousness in, in our modern context. Um, you know, you, it, human beings were also primitive until uh, a couple hundred thousand years ago is what I guess. And so in all that time, your self, your psyche, uh, has kept you alive in many ways. I mean, for example, um, your heart beats 72 times a minute and you never think about that, you know, usually anyway. Uh, you breathe 12 times a minute, you never think about that. That's not, not in your conscious mind, but your body is just doing that. Uh, your, all of your cells, except I guess bones uh, reach, or in brain tissue, our brain cells uh, regenerate every seven years. So you're not the same physical person you were even seven years ago. Um, and so our body, the human body knows a lot of things that we don't consciously know mm. or think about or, or have in our consciousness, right? And so one of those functions that it has that all creatures have uh, and certainly our um, primate predecessors is um, instinct to survive. And so, uh, for example, you probably have had the experience of um, uh, feeling like you're falling if you're just going to sleep and, and waking up with a start. Well, that, that's an autonomic response that developed in primates before there were human beings but because our ancestors were living in trees to protect them from predators mm, sure. and and that that response probably took a million years to develop or more okay a billion years i'm sorry a billion years to develop not a million and um 
And so we still have it. And almost all human beings still experience it at some point. You just wake up with a start and you feel like you're falling out of a tree. That's what it really literally is. And it's, it's the automatic response that wakes you, that, you know, saves your life and lets, wakes you up and makes you hold on to the tree. Right, right. <laughs> you know? right. Okay. So our body knows a lot of stuff we don't, okay? Consci- we don't consciously know. And so it never tells us anything we don't need to know. Okay. And so when you say people have hallucinations or um, visions or dreams, yeah, yourself, the young used to call it the two million year old man, but it's actually the three and a half billion year old Mm man uh, that um, the self is constantly doing things to keep you alive. And one of them is saying, uh, pay attention to this. <laughs> you know, here's something you ought to think about, mm-hmm, reflect sure. upon. And so um, I won't talk about other people's dreams and visions, but I'll tell you about one of mine that's very practical and, um, and you'll probably relate to it. Um, I have never needed a radar detector, okay? I've never needed a radar detector. And the reason is that every time I'm, there's a speed trap or any other police activity in my near life in the next, if, if I'm going to see a police car within two to three minutes, I get a vision. The vision is always exactly the same. It's a police car, a black and white police car with the word police across the side. It's going from right to left across my my field of view. And it's a vision. And it says, police, pay attention. Hmm. And it works better than a radar detector. Wow. And But invariably, if that vision pops up in my psyche, if I think about that, or if I think about the police, you know, if I'm driving along and all of a sudden I think about the police, then almost invariably within two to three minutes, I'll see police, police activity of some sort. Mm. And um, of course, it's very useful on the highway because <laughs> um, it, it comes up before speed traps. Now, why does it work? Well, it works because uh, when we're driving along, maybe the oncoming traffic changes its speed ever so slightly, just um, just a little bit when it, when the oncoming traffic has already seen the speed trap, okay? Right. Or the oncoming traffic has already seen the cop. You haven't seen him yet, but boom, it's there, okay? Every time. So the traffic slowing down in the other direction prompts your unconscious to think there must be a speed trap up there. And then, right. and then it delivers me that vision. Interesting. Okay. And the other, the other one is, uh, is, you know, flashing headlights. People flash headlights when they see a speed trap. Right, 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 right. right. Sometimes. And, um, you know, there are all kinds of subtle cues that, you know, you're not consciously thinking about, you're going along talking to your wife or what have you, and uh, you're never even thinking about that. But all of a, su- a sudden, boom, you get this vision. Mm-hmm. I do anyway, that's my vision. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you you have to be sensitive to what your visions are, right? But that's mine. And that's what it looks like. And whenever I get that vision, I immediately slow down and mind my P's and Q's in my driving because I know I'm going to see police activity of some sort. And when about, you say it's a vision, I mean, do you act, do you physically see it as if it's yes. in your line of sight? Interesting. Okay. Right. In other words, it's, you know, it would be like something going across a movie screen or a TV screen. Sure, 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 sure. In my, in, you know, and, you know, it's like when you're, okay, you're driving along and you're listening to an audible book, for example, you're actually seeing the story in your mind. Sure. Okay. Okay. And so, you know, I'm seeing it in my mind's eye 
um, you know, I'm not, I'm not physically seeing it in these two eyes. Right, right, right. right. Like a hallucination. It's, it appears in your, in your psyche. Yeah, right. And, and so, um, you know, that sort of thing happens all the time. Uh, and sometimes, um, you know, sometimes these things are triggered by trauma. Um, and so, um, uh, the, the Mephistopheles vision that you uh, mentioned, I did have, and um, it came up in the following circumstance. Um, my, my daughter had been to Russia for about two years with, on a USAID fellowship, and um, she came back to Washington, and it was her 22nd birthday. So I invited her out to, bur out to dinner for her birthday. We went to this lovely uh, Afghan restaurant in downtown Washington. And we had a wonderful time talking because we had so many things that we had done together. Um, I had taken them to Japan when she was three years old and spent five years there in Japan with her. We had traveled around the world together when she was a little girl. And uh, although I later divorced her mother, I always stayed close to the, my daughters, right? And, um, and so we had this lovely evening, but she had fallen in with fundamentalists in, in uh, Kazan, Tataristan. These are... Christian fundamentalists. Sure. And because there weren't any other um, Americans around, she naturally mm. got attracted to their group because they were American young people who right. were, who were a uh, little, little bit of Stockholm syndrome. Right, 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 right. And so we have this lovely evening for three hours together. I'm just um, a buzz with happiness about the time we've spent together. And the last thing she says to me, she says, well, dad, I'm sorry to say this to you, but I think you're going to hell. It's rough. Who teaches a child to say such a thing to a parent? Mm. You know, among other things. I mean, but fortunately, I did not fall into the devil's trick, which is important to understand. Okay. Uh, and Ann Ulanoff, who's a Jungian um, psychiatrist, she's, and she was professor of, believe it or not, psychology and religion at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Okay, so Ann Ulanoff talks about the devil's trick. And the devil's trick would be for that I would blame it on my daughter, blame that comment on my daughter, get angry with her, and uh, start doing all kinds of spiteful things and basically lose my daughter over it. Mm -hmm, okay, sure. that's, that's the devil's trick. But um, so, but I did blame it on fundamentalists that she'd fall, fallen into um, in with in Kazan. So I, I, I I left this dinner and I had to drive from Washington back to Annapolis where I live. This is Annapolis be behind me. That's the Chesapeake Bay bridge there. And um, as I was dri driving across, I had, and probably this vision lasted five to 10 seconds. I'm not exactly sure how long, okay. but I'm driving along at 65 miles an hour. And all of a sudden, Mephistopheles plops down in the passenger seat of my car. Like the devil, right? Mephistopheles the devil, is... Mephistopheles, but Mephistopheles that I, as I had imagined him in Faustus. Okay, I read Faust when I was in college, you know, 50, 60 years ago, now, 55 sure. years ago. But I'd read Faust and I had a vision of what Faust would look like. And this was the guy. What did it okay. look like? Was it? Horns well, he, and he, you know, he was uh, you know, red with a black beard and right and so on, and horns and so mm -hmm. on. And um, so I, I, I said, 
I'm going to cut the Fa Faustian bargain with you, which is that you can have my eternal soul on my death, provided none of my daughters think that of me for the rest of my life. And boom, he disappeared. Interesting. Okay. Now, did he did he did he appear in your actual vision, or was it still in the mind's eye type? Well, fortunately, I was into Jungian psychology enough by then that I knew that it was it was a uh, psychic emanation. It was a psychic event, right. but but nonetheless, it seemed quite real. Mm. And you know, you can imagine if you have a vision like that, it can be quite frightening. And you're driving along, at I would imagine, yeah, sixty five miles an hour on a icy highway, and Satan shows up. Yeah, that's pretty rough. Yeah, that's rough. And so I said, oh my god, now I understand how all these fundamentalists scare people into into religion because if they talk fire and brimstone enough to people then they're going to cause these visions of hell and damnation to right, generate right, right. in their psyche and and so god I, I thought wow that's how they've been doing it for thousands of years and it works so they do it Mm, program the unconscious basically right yeah. right <clears throat> so that's that was that experience now the good news is that um, my daughter is now 44 and so i'll just uh share with you uh, something that happened uh, sure. oh, i actually have it here on my on my desktop it happens because i've been talking about it uh, lately, but um, this is my friend Tim Holmes, mm -hmm. and this this sculpture is a, is a sculpture that Tim did, and he did it as a commission uh, for an award that was given to this man, whose name is Elias uh, Shakur, and Elias Shakur was the Archbishop of Galilee, and um, when he was a young priest. Um, and let me see if I can expand that. Can I expand it? I guess not. Um, when Shakur was a young priest, um, he, he had just gone into this church and the head of the congregation came up to him and said, we have to get rid of this vine outside, outside. And so he said, let me see. And they went outside and he says, isn't it lovely? It's a grapevine that was given by our neighbor. And the head of the congregation says, well, it's, it's a Muslim vine and it has to go uh, because the neighbor was Muslim. <laughs> and so Shakur says to him, bring me a bucket. So the guy runs and gets a bucket of water, uh, thinking that he's going to dig the vine up. And mm -hmm. so he has him pour the water over his hands. And he says, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy <laughs> Ghost. <laughs> Amen. Now it's a Christian vine. And That's funny. <laughs> and, and it can stay. <laughs> so the, this, this uh, sculpture by my friend Tim, uh, you know, is about that moment. Mm -hmm. um, but so anyway, that sculpture, um, Tim was permitted to make a series of 20 copies of it. And so on my daughter's 44th birthday, exactly half of her life later, uh, I gave that as a gift to her mm, without poetic. Ever, I never, I never mentioned, I never mentioned the incident when she was sure. two, which I'm not even sure she remembers on it. Sure, sure, sure. Does she watch um, your, your no, YouTube I channel? Don't, I don't no? think so. I okay. Think got it. Got it. Um, but, but she might see it one day because this sure. stuff is evergreen. <laughs> sure. Well, that's certainly, certainly seen Satan while driving down the road. At, yeah. And so I, I just thought that was so symmetrical that I, I could give her Tim's sculpture. <laughs> 22 years later. <laughs> exactly. Half, right. a, half a lifetime later. Right. So, so, so I, I know the other, uh, I don't know, vision or experience you had with, I guess it'd be possession of an archetype. You said you were possessed by the anima for yeah. a period of eight months. What right. was that like in terms? What was the context of that? And then what was that like in terms of well, your subjective experience? 
again, it came up, it came up from something that I found fairly traumatic, which was um, by that time I was already um, retired from the Marine Corps. I, I retired as a Lieutenant Colonel. Um, and, um, and so when Gulf War I ended, um, Norman Schwarzkopf wanted to run this parade in Washington, D.C., his war parade. And uh, I don't think we should aggrandize the military. I've, I've been a military, in the military my whole life. My father was a naval officer and I'm a Marine and, and uh, I still maintain my commission. I still have an ID card. And so, but it's always been a value of ours that we shouldn't aggrandize the military, that, um, you know, nobody really wants to fight a war, but we have to know how. And so, because somebody else might want to take over our country, right? <laughs> but it doesn't mean we want to fight a war. And if we aggrandize the military, um, you know, the way many dictators do, then, you know, it makes it seem like we want to be belligerents. And so I was very angry uh, that day, the day of that uh, war parade. And I was living on Capitol Hill at the time. So I decided to take a walk around the Capitol and um, figure out what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And uh, what I came up with at the time was um, I want to be a writer. Maybe I want to write a novel. And then over the next few months, I, um, and uh, so I learned from an article from um, Michael Crichton in the, in the Wall Street Journal. He's the author of Jurassic Park. And he was asked, uh, what do you do to write a novel? And uh, the answer was, uh, you ask a question and then answer it. So obviously, mm. Jurassic Park, Park is question. What would happen what, if, if yeah. dinosaurs came to life? Yeah, right, yeah. right, right, exactly. And so um, what came to my mind over the next few months was a question that I had asked my father when I was 15. And we were living in Japan and we had a, a housekeeper who was uh, she was probably 23 years old at the time, and she was living with us. We had a very small room, and she could live in there, and then she helped my mother cook and wash dishes and that sort of thing. And um, so one Saturday, I asked my father, you know, why is Michiko-san here? And he said, well, um, in Japan, uh, women come to Tokyo to earn their dowry. Uh, we weren't living in Tokyo, but they come to civilization uh, from the farms to earn their dowry and then they go back. And so when you say earn their dowry, that means. Well, they they uh, in countries where a dowry is required, um, the the bride's family has to pay money to the groom's right. family. Right. right. Okay. Oh, okay. And, you know, you see that even in, if you see uh, Shakespeare in Love, the movie sure, Shakespeare yeah. in Love. Bride's family pays the... Yeah, pay, you know, buys the, <laughs> buys the son-in-law the son -in -law with yes. the dowry, right? right? And so these farm girls who are quite poor ha would have to come to Tokyo. And of course, so when I was 15, I just let that qu question sit but it worked in my unconscious for 33 years. Okay. And so in 1993, um, or actually late 1992, uh, a Jungian analyst named uh, Clarissa Pincola Estes wrote a book entitled Women Who Run With the Wolves. And it was a blowout bestseller for a couple of years. And I can actually show it to you because I always keep it in arm's reach, but um, by that, by that time, by 93, I'd already been, been into Jungian stuff for six years. And so I knew that artistic work 
if it's going to be successful, needs to be archetypal. In other words, you know, Dick and Jane go up the hill isn't really archetypal, right? Right. <laughs> but, but um, you know, the the great paintings of Caravaggio, let's say, or Michelangelo, um, those people did archetypal work, and so they're the great masters. Mm -hmm. And so that's true in, in all art, but, you know, it's certainly in writing and in painting and so on. And so I knew I wanted to write a novel. I had thought of this question about what if a girl like Michiko-san, but I called her Mako in my novel, what if she comes to Tokyo to earn her dowry, what would that be like? And she becomes the first woman prime minister of Japan. What, was the, what would be the evolution of that over a lifetime? And so I had gone back to Japan 16 years after I finished high school um, to start this company over there. And during that five-year period, I had the full Monty of Japanese business life, okay? What all the experiences that anybody would have. Um, and, uh, and that includes nightclubs and, and geisha bars and all that sure. stuff, right? And so I had learned quite a lot about the way Japanese society works. And also during that five-year period, I realized that, oh my God, after 9 p.m. on, on um, Japanese TV, it's very common to see a detective show in which a woman uh, gets almost raped or raped and her top gets torn off so that her breasts are visible, um, which probably we don't wouldn't have here in the U.S. on normal broadcast TV. Right, unless it's SVU, Law and Order or something. Right, and but in... In Japan, that was very common. And after midnight, the late night shows would have nude women on on them, you know, full frontal nudity. And this is back in the 80s, the early 80s. And, and I presume it hasn't changed a lot since then. Uh, but um, so, I mean, that, that's just a, a snapshot of the types of things I had run into when I was there on business. And so I pick up Estes's book and um, I started, well, my mother gave it to my wife for Christmas. And so I picked it up on like the day after Christmas, 1992. And I started to read it and I said to my wife, you can't have it. <laughs> and I read it cover to cover in nice. like, like two days. <laughs> but in that book, there's a, there's a story, uh, which is chapter three, um, called Vasilisa the Wise. And it's about how women um, gain their intuition faculty, how, how that happens. Uh, archetypally. And after that story, there's about a 40 page dissertation by Estes, in which she talks about the nine steps that women go through, um, that causes them to become quite intuitive. Um, and it sort of amounts to woman's individuation. Mm. Okay. And so I said, wow, okay, I want to write this novel about this farm girl from age 15 to age 75. And now I have a template. Um, sure. What are some <laughs> of those steps? Well, I mean, step, I don't know if I remember them all, but uh, step one is like leaving the good mother behind. So you, you have to, you know, leave your mother somehow. Okay. And of course, in parental raising, child raising, <laughs> it's the stories of young girls, early teenage girls fighting with their mothers. Though that's a classic story. Yeah, I hear right? that's common. Right, and and so, but that's a step that they have to go through, where they 
separate themselves from their mother's sure. ideas, right? And and so it's a normal. It's like uh, you know um, when a when you have a small baby. Um, when they're about two and a half or three, they'll say no. And to refuse to do something you want them to do. And that is when their ego is starting to develop. Okay, that's a that's a sign that right. their e ego is starting to develop. Because they have their own wants and goals and drives. Right, right. And so anyway, there are these nine steps. I recommend the book to you. <laughs> You'll learn a lot. <laughs> sure. <laughs> every, man, every man should read that book. <laughs> Women who run with the wolves, but uh, particularly that chapter and and that 40 page dissertation, which, you know, they probably still have it in the bookstore. So you could go sit in the in Barnes and Noble and read that 40 pages and <laughs> you'd learn a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I said, okay, so I'm gonna take my heroine through that nine steps now this is all very logos oriented right i that was just very logical how i was going to do that. sure structure outline all that yeah right and so then uh, i started to write it and then boom within about two days um mako who's the who's the heroine in my story uh started to wake me up every morning at six o'clock and make me come to my computer and I would sit down and almost in the dark, I turned my, my um, monitor down almost the lowest possible level. And I put my hands on the keyboard and this novel wrote itself, okay? I, it was like taking dictation almost. And, I don't, I have no recollection of actually typing the novel. What I have is a recollection of a vision of the movie going across in front of my eyes. And so um, I- and So this was possession by the anima. Right, because she wanted me to tell her story. Okay, in other words, once I got in my mind that I wanted to tell this story from 15 to 75, then, it was it was an archetypal possession and one of the things about an archetype is once it starts to play it's like a jukebox once you start to play that record it doesn't stop until it's done okay Interesting. and so an example where it's never done is motherhood okay if a woman has a baby then she's a mother okay and she's a mother for the rest of her life mm -hmm. and that the mother archetype will play out through her no matter what else happens once I'm she's saying, a mother sure. you know up until the time she's a mother fine she might be a tomboy or whatever but once she's a mother boom she's a mother and and you can never stop that archetype from playing okay is the same true with like a father is it the father archetype is it as strong or is it uh probably not as strong because men are not as closely involved with the up sure. upbringing of the child but sure. but obviously the father archetype is important and jordan peterson is fulfilling that role for uh, lots millions of men uh, obviously mm -hmm. so um so anyway um this archetype that was playing through Mako's story kicked off. And once it kicked off, I couldn't stop it. Okay. I, it had to play and, it, and I had to do this. So every day at six, about six in the morning, I would have a vision of this 15 year old Japanese girl in kimono coming over and waking me up. Literally. This is when you me. were, is, was this a dream or was this after you'd waken up the vision came? Uh, sort of both. Okay, sure. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I can't say whether I was asleep or awake. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. But anyway, I was getting up no matter what. I had to do it. And then I would go into my study and I'd turn on my computer monitor very low, put my hands on the keyboard. And every day I wrote 500 to 1,000 words of some part of that story. 
And once I had written, you know, that segment, then I was released for the rest of the day. Mm. Okay, then I could go to for the rest of the day. But for that eight month period, I had to do it every day. And if I didn't do it every day, I'd be in trouble. Okay. And so it had to come through. Now, what, do you mean you, what do you mean you'd be in trouble? Uh, my animal would trip me up somehow. Okay. Interesting. And, um, and so I surmise that, uh, you know, archetypal stories that have come out of great novelists are like that. And when novelists say they have writer's block, it's because they can't get back to that space mm. to write. Um, and I know how to drop into that space anytime I want to. And I often, I, I'm sort of always in it now, but, um, <clears throat> but, you know, some, a lot of writers, especially in the mid, mid 20th century would become alcoholics or drug addicts because they would be trying to get back into that space artificially and sure. they couldn't do it. And mm. the, and the alcohol or drugs took over and killed them basically. Right. 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 And so people like Arthur Miller is a good example. Um, Wasn't Hemingway a pretty Hemingway, heavy alcoholic? Hemingway was an example. He yeah. shot himself when he was 63. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, you know, there, there are many, many cases of that, but it, it's just not understanding how that functionality works. And, you know, their early careers were dependent upon it. Mine wasn't right. And so I wrote this story mm -hmm. and Parts of it are quite pornographic, okay, but all of it is true, <laughs> and and so um, so I was in the middle of my business career. It was 1993, and my wife is is a very wise woman, and she said that she would not read my story. And she's had a she had a lot of experience in Japan, um, and and so she knew what some of the things I would be writing about. And she said she didn't want to read it until I'd written the whole book and shown it to nine other or 10 other women. Once I, once I had 10 other women read it, then she would read it. All clear. Interesting. Right. Sure. And so fortunately at that time I was working in a, in an industry of women. So I didn't have any trouble finding women <laughs> who wanted to read the book. Nice. And, and, the reaction I got, I, I was very surprised because I had thought that the pornography would turn them off. You know, I, I say it's an erotic novel when I'm in polite com <laughs> company, but it, mm -hmm. it's, it's really, you know, it's something like Fanny Hill or uh, what Anne Rice wrote in The Taking of Sleeping Beauty or something like that. Um, and... Uh, and so I was in the middle of my business career, which involved traveling to some very conservative countries, Saudi Arabia and India. And uh, so I didn't want to get known for having written this novel. And so I, uh, I put it in my drawer for um, 21 years and never did anything with it. But I promised myself when I was 70, I would publish it. And actually, I jumped the gut a little bit, but um, I did publish it uh, on Kindle in uh, 2014. But the, what gave me confidence to do it was keeping in mind this was visioning and, and you know, well, certainly a lot of visioning because I was visioning the novel itself. Um, but in 2009, Dr. Young's Red Book came out. And so that was 16 years after I'd actually written my novel. And I looked at his Red Book and I said, oh my God, well, if this could happen to the most famous psychiatrist, psychologist of the 20th century, and he was okay, then maybe I'm okay too. Sure. <laughs> right. But it still took me another five years before I brought myself around to actually putting it out where people could get it. And um, 
and now I now it's it's on um, it's on Amazon in Kindle form, and uh, it's it's also in uh, my drop boxes for the groups that I run. So sure, so, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And, I, and it's free there. So right, yes, I it's I uh, t- uh was it three years ago, four years ago now? I are you familiar with Game of Thrones? Yeah, sure. Have you shown? Have you seen it all? No. Okay. The it's well known for the last season being awful. Like it uh-huh. was a great show, and then the last season is just absolute garbage. Right. And so I've always been interested in in fiction and stuff, and I actually started writing uh, my own kind of fiction novel. It's in that same kind of genre, and I've had that idea of I I want to publish it when I'm sixty or seventy. I want I, I want it to be sort of a an archetypal journal. You know, as I learn through life, I can. You know, if I'm going to write the wise king character, well, I, at 24, I probably don't know enough to, to, to write that out yet, but yeah. kind of write it in, in segments and stuff. Um, so that's interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, uh, you, one way to do it is to learn the tarot, which I teach every Monday night. And the tarot really has the high points of the archetypal journey. In right. It, that's, something, in it. that's something I actually wanted to ask you. So tarot cards... Yeah. To the average person, at least it, it, in my circles, would sound like this is crazy. This is what you're it's like palm reading or, you know, right. whatever. It, other it's like what 13 year old girls do. Right? Right, 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 right. But I but I've and I've I've seen some of your stuff on it. But I mean, could you kind of go into what the actual psychological value of it? It's a projection of archetypes, right? It's precisely. I, well, let, let's put it like this. The major arcana, which is the first 22 cards, are. Um, which includes the zero card, which is the fool, and the 21 card, which is the world, but it means fully individuated person. Um, They they cover the main experiences of life, the archetypal experiences of life. And so... um, uh, if, you know, I just talk you through the first three or four here. So the fool is the zero card and that's all of us when we, um, when we start something new, right. You know, we don't know we're stepping off a cliff. The, the, um, the fool is stepping off a cliff and, um, and so if you, if you read about what the fool means, then you start to see yourself in it, right? And then the number one card is the magician. So the magician is, um, he's having his, holding his hand up to the sky and his other hand is pointed down to the earth. And on the table in front of him, he has four things. He has a, a sword, a... Um, a wand or a stave, uh, a cup, and a coin, okay, which is the four suits of the tarot, which also happen to be the four functions of Jungian psychology, mm-hmm. okay? Right, and, for like the Myers-Briggs personality test, right? Right, That's the- and so, so the point is, from here, from this moment, Paul, when you're, I don't know what you're going to do after you hang up from this call, but you have, you are the magician of your own life. And so you will pick of all the choices of things you can do, you will pick something to do. Okay. And it will be from one of these four functions. Okay. It will be either something creative, which is the wands, uh, something um, discerning, which is thinking, Um, and the wands are creative is intuition, right? In terms Mm -hmm. of the Myers-Briggs type indicator, um, or it will be something that feeds, feeds something emotional, like, um, getting a present for a girlfriend or something like that, you know, (laughs) and, and the, and the fourth thing is it could be coins. So, So it could have to do with accumulation of physical objects in your life, whatever that may mean. Um, And that's the sensing side. So if I take it in terms of 
how we learn it in the Marine Corps, where um, you know I I studied this in five senior schools in Marine Corps, you know, the Naval War College, the National War College, uh, the Command and Staff College, Center for Creative Leadership. All of them taught us the Myers Briggs and why, because um, you know, for a mission, for a military mission, you need these four functions, okay, to uh, act properly and to uh, be discerning. And most military, senior military officers are STJ, which means they're sensing, thinking, and judging. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. You probably don't have many super yeah. creative artists in high right. command. But, but, those guys get max out at two stars. The guys that make three and four stars, people like Colin Powell, are intuitive. Okay, so here's how it works. I'm quite intuitive. I'm way out on the intuitive scale. So, you know, I, I see three trees and I assume there's a forest. But if I show you a, a thousand trees and you're a sensing person, you won't, you won't necessarily believe there's a forest. Okay. A thousand individual trees. Right. Uh, so, so the point is in a military operation, you need sensing people to get all the facts. Okay. All the physical facts that are in the world that relate to your mission. Then you need an intuitive person to um, conjure how those facts come together, bring those facts together and to envision how this mission should play out and you know which units should do what and that sort of thing and then you need uh, thinking people to um, to work out the details of, of the mission to very logically work out what you're going to do and and we have we have very rational ways of doing that in the military. Sure. And, um, and then you need feeling people to tell you, well, if you achieve this, if you do it successfully, this is what the outcome is going to be. Mm, okay? okay. And this is, this is what it's going to mean for yourself, your country, you know, this war, whatever it is. Um, this is what the outcome is going to be and how it's going to be uh, seen by people in the future, let's say. Sure. So, so the, does, I mean, for, I don't know if it's on a mission by mission basis or, you know, if you're assembling a battalion or something, does the military actually put stock in, we know we have these, we've got this many people who are sensing thinking we have this many people who are intuitive or not. Are they actually measuring that like at the Myers-Briggs level or is it more yes. like general? Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So as I said, I went to five senior schools and I was a reserve officer for most of my career uh, for 20 years out of 23, I was a reserve officer, but, um, but when you're a reservist, they'll send you for two weeks active duty. So I went to these five senior schools in the military and um, out of the 10 days, 10 work days that they have you in your two weeks of active duty, out of the 10 work days, they take one full day. So 10% of the time they have you to teach you the Myers-Briggs Wow! at all these senior schools. So that's how important it is. Sure. Um, and uh, so, yes, they do. And, and you know, the... The people we get ahead that get ahead in the military mostly are uh, sensing thinkers, of course. Right, because okay? they can judge, operate within and that. judges, you know, judges who can make a decision very quickly, easily. Because right. there's a right. fixed set of rules and it's algorithmic to follow. So the people who are good at following and seeing the algorithm and just playing right. it through. Okay, but but what would happen? People would come to me and say, sir, uh, please tell me what I'm supposed to do and I'll go do it, you know? Uh, and you say, okay, Captain, I want you to take your destroyer over that, over that horizon and kill that son of a bitch and report back. And he says, aye, aye, sir, and he goes away and he comes back. But, um, but those are those, but what they would say to me is, 
tell me what I'm supposed to do and I'll do it, but don't make me deal with the politics. Okay. Don't right. Make me deal. Right. Okay. And the problem is politics is all about intuition and mm. feeling. Okay. Context that how does this play into the bigger picture? Versus, right. 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 And so um, even, you know, I'm still reading seven pillars of wisdom uh, right here. This is T.E. Lawrence's book. He's uh, Lawrence of Arabia. And uh, he says right at the beginning of it, um, I was just reading it a few minutes ago, as a matter of fact, but he says, you know, for the, for the officers, it wasn't bad because we could see the future. But for, um, for the enlisted men, they, they can't see the future. They, they don't have the intuition to project what it's going to mean. They just have to follow orders and you give them the orders and they do it. But the officers are trained well enough so that they see all sides of the, right. of the issue. Um, and so anyway, what, what was the question we got started on? We were relating this back to tarot cards. Right. Okay. So, so with the magician uh, uh, card, number one, at every moment of your life, you are the magician and you have all the assets to do, to magically do whatever it is you're going to do in your life. And um, there's one young quote, which I have done in calligraphy. I have a heap of books next to me here. I buried this, but I'll, I'll share it with you. Um, in fact, I'll tell you what, I'll put it up on the screen because I think I have it easily here. Um, just have to, oh yeah, okay. Um, okay, so I'll just read it off of this. Uh, this is called the eternal moment, but this, uh, this applies now to the, the moment of the magician. And this is every moment of your life. And so here's what it says. The great thing is now and here, this is the eternal moment. And if you do not realize it, you have missed the best part of life. You have missed the realization that you were once the carrier of life contained between the poles of an unimaginable future and an unimaginably remote past. Millions of years and untold millions of ancestors have worked up to this moment and you are the fulfillment of this eternal moment. Um, one should take each moment as the eternal moment, as if nothing were ever going to change, not anticipating a faraway future, for the future always grows out of that which is. You must live life in such a spirit that you make in every moment the best of the possibilities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that hits on being present but I, yeah I, like alan watts i know is big into that like the right. present is where life happens there is no tomorrow tomorrow's a concept right and so so the point of the number one card in the tarot is simply that that in every moment of your life you are the magician and you have the choice of which tool that's on your table in the tarot card which tool to pick up and use to forward, take your life forward. You're the right. magician. And so then the number two card is the high priestess. And the high priestess is um, this very mysterious woman. Right? <laughs> and and um, I was listening to Paul Fender Clay the other day, and he was talking about pornography. And he said that, that, um, yeah, well, men that use pornography without having a woman in their life, you know, in, in a sense, they, they're sensible because there's nothing more terrifying than an actual woman. <laughs> <laughs> Truth and wisdom there. 
Right. And so, so the number two card is the high priestess and she anima architect, the anima. Right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Sure. And she's, she's this mystery. And, and, uh, if you're a man, you know, you're never going to understand this mystery. There's no way. Um, and the best you can do is, is learn to live with it. I, I have a cup that I was using this morning, which says, if a man is in the de- speaks in the desert and no woman hears him, is he still wrong? And the answer to the question is yes. <laughs> And the reason is because if you think about the yin yang and masculine feminine, Mm -hmm. you're only ever, ever half of that, um, of that uh, mandala, you know, as a man, you're all the masculine only has half of it. And so no matter what you say, the woman in your life, the fe- the feminine in your life, whatever that is, it doesn't have to be by gender a, f- a woman, but uh, whatever the feminine is in your life is going to scream at you immediately. Right, it's the other know, half. Or tell you what's wrong with what you're thinking. <laughs> sure. So anyway, um, right. so that's, uh, so the third, the third card is uh, the empress, which is mother. And, um, and so the empress is pregnant in the, in the most basic tarot decks, the, the empress is pregnant. And the number four card is the emperor, uh, who is father and the father figure. Sure. And, and so what, so in terms of understanding your life and what you're facing, um, if you understand those 21 cards, you're going to understand really huge parts of your life okay and uh, the number five card is the hierophant who is a teacher but he's also telling you what the rules are and that sort of thing sure Um, and so if you read about these things you start to understand okay i now i understand what this archetype is all those archetypes are there Mm -hmm. okay so then um after the number 10 card well let's let's say you can get through a lot of things in a certain context so you know uh you know if i was a marine and um i did that for 23 years and on january the 4th 1990 i was walking across the parking lot at marine corps base quantico and i slipped on the ice and broke my leg Marine Corps career over. <laughs> Wait, this action this happened or? Yeah, yeah. It oh, definitely wow. happened. Sure. And uh it's been with me ever since mm. I in 2018 I had to have my ankle replaced, as a matter of fact, physically replaced. Mm. So I now have a a stainless steel ankle in my foot. Sure. Um, but fortunately the surgeons have you know, save my foot, but I could have lost it that day. um, Because uh, when I first looked down at my foot after I'd fallen, um, my foot was not on my leg, it was literally pulled off of my leg. And, and um, so I could have had very serious vascular damage, Mm. which would have been enough to have my leg amputated below the knee. So, but that didn't happen. I, I, I've had a prosthesis ever since, and that had to be replaced in, in 2018. So 28 years later, um, but sure. so shit happens, you know, and, and, you know, you get fired or you discontinue your work and it's happened to me many times and it's, why I'm here right now, because Mm. when it happens, then you go on and do something else. And that's the point. You're always in the eternal moment. You're always in the role of the magician and you always can find something to do with your life based on the assets that are in front of you. And, and if you understand that you're, you know, you do very well in life, but um, so 
just an example, the I think it's the 14 card is the tower. Um, it might be the 16 card, I don't remember exactly, uh, but is the tower. And that's uh, uh, a symbol of your world falling apart. And archetypally that happens to all of us. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be prepared if it happens. And we, you know, you can go take your life or you can, <laughs> you can be like trees, you know, they get a, a limb cut off because the telephone company wants to go through there with a power line or a telephone line, right? And so the tree just puts out another shoot and starts mm -hmm. growing another branch, right? right? And so you have to be like that if you're going to live a long life, really. Mm -hmm. And you know, we we're now living five times as long as our ancestors at the time of Stonehenge, people were living to be about 20 on average. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time my ancestors came to America, the average age was 40 in, in a lifetime. And uh, so now we're up to 75 or 76. And, you know, obviously, some of us live quite a bit longer so that i'm just talking about the average but um but the reason is because we have these accidents under control and we have disease under control and so on so right. we can keep going on so you see that even though i'm at close to the average life expectancy of a human being yeah, I'm still pretty active and, and I can do a lot of things. Sure. Uh, right. You know, so, the archetype is still there. Yes. Right. So, I mean, that, I think we ought to stop on talking about the Tarot, but, but that's why to pay attention to it. Now, in terms of divination in Tarot, divination is a different thing. Okay. What I've been talking about is studying the tarot to understand the archetypes that are there and the major arcana are the archetypes and the minor arcana are the typical things that would happen to you in a lifetime okay, mm, okay. that's what it amounts to so if you understand the minor arcana when there are 56 of them um then then you basically have a heads up on anything that could happen to you in life and, and so in terms of preparing for life, man, I would study the Tarot because then nothing's going to surprise you, basically. <laughs> right? What's an example of a minor arcana? Uh, well, okay. Um, uh, I guess the, the seven, uh, the five of swords, let's say which is after the battle, there's five swords lying there on the, on the beach. And, but there's one guy that's stealing the swords and stealing away with them. And, and so, you know, even when the, it means even when the battle is over, you could still have another battle and you better, you know, gather your weapons up. Sure. <laughs> and sure. Be prepared. Be prepared. Right. And, and so that would be an example. Um, you know, the aces of all the suits are, are, you know, the, the starting out in any field in terms of what you're doing. So in the, in the coins, it's starting to put together your, your uh, life savings or whatever it is mm -hmm. and and so the the king of coins is this miser who's who's guarding the all the money that he put together in a lifetime sure. okay but then if if you do that oh there's always the unexpected like uh the financial crash of 2008 so i was worth uh over a million dollars with my home and so on. And I lost everything. Um, and, and. All right. I know you took it to all the way to the Supreme court, right? Yep. Yep. I did. And, um, and I never got a hearing. Okay. I never got a hearing because if they'd given me a hearing, uh, they would, uh, they, they, 
would have had to open up the possibility of of lawsuits in every county in the United States because it's all fraudulent. It's all fraudulent. Mm, right. Oh, yeah. And, and so and the mortgage industry is horrific and you just have to ho hope that nothing happens uh, because if it does, uh, lots of people get screwed. And right. in, in that case, 10 million families lost their homes and it shouldn't have happened if people weren't greedy on Wall Street. It wouldn't have happened, but it did happen. So, mm -hmm. but let's let's go on from that and talk about uh, Jordan Peterson. Yes, I was just going to say my favorite piñata. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, so like I said, I you know I've listened to a lot of your stuff and I understand sort of your basic critiques. Um, you talk about there's a difference between. Lo logos and arrows you say jordan peterson's a logos guy so he's more focused on order or that which is structure yeah. structure right now i think from my understanding you know he talks about order versus chaos and i would say far more central to his claims about order or logos are that meaning and that the proper path forward exists in the balance between order and chaos that there's a there's a path chaos is not necessarily bad he talks about chaos is both danger and opportunity and order is you know safety and stagnation so pathological order is totalitarianism and pathological chaos is you know revolution and and everything falling apart right. so when you talk about logos versus eros well it seems to me that that maps directly on to order versus chaos well you're right, except it's not order. It's not logos against chaos, um, because in the eros is both chaos and also all of our lives. And so the logos provides us with structure in which we live and we learn how to use things. So if you look around your room right now and you've got a guitar there, you've got a, mm -hmm. a picture on the wall. Right. You're sitting in a nice leather chair and so on. All those things aren't possible without logos. So we need logos 100% because logos uh, is the rational, rationality. It's putting together the, the plans to build those things, each one of them in a special way. Uh, but, you know, you can have the instructions for building a guitar and still not be able to play it. Right. right. And and so everything in our life that is a physical thing and not a living person is logos. OK. And it's or it's the result of of logos. Uh, and we need it to be perfect. hundred percent. You wouldn't have that guitar if you didn't think that was a guitar that you wanted to have in your life. Right. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't have that picture on the wall if, it, if that wasn't a picture that you liked. I mean, mm -hmm. I can't really. Spaceman drinking a beer on the moon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can't really see it really what it is. It captures my spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. So, so, so it captures your spirit, but what is your spirit? That's the question, right? Sure. And, and so the point is all that stuff is logos. And so we need logos 100%. And I agree, I agree with Jordan 100% on that. But um, the other side of the equation is life itself. Okay. Yes. And, and so life is chaotic. Shit happens, man. Mm. <laughs> and, and 2020 uh, was a uh, reminder of that in case anyone forgot. Yeah. Right. And, and so, um, so logos helps us make highs or tails of it because we can stand on the shoulders of our ancestors and um, and be okay, right? But you know, it's like the the primate falling out of the tree. Um, you know the 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 logos in the DNA taught over a billion years primates to wake up and not fall out of the tree to maintain their balance in the tree so sure. they wouldn't fall down and be eaten. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's, uh, that's in the DNA. Uh, but 
but the waking up and the catching the branch, that's, that's life, man. Sure. That's, right. That's, that's the subjective actual experience. Right. And so, so that's where I differ from Jordan because he thinks that logos is opposite chaos only. And I say, no, logos is opposite logos eros, change. which includes both chaos and everything about your life. Okay. Sure. I guess because I don't, I, I guess I don't fully understand that distinction because, well, I guess what, what is, so what are the consequences of, to the degree that you think he's wrong, then what, what then does he say or prescribe that you think is in error? Well, okay. Um, you know, make a, make a list of the features that you'd like to have in your spouse. Are you married? I'm not. No. Okay. So not make yet. a list of all the things that you'd like your spouse to be okay and and then find a woman that meets that exactly i can tell you it's a terrifying experience that sounds (laughs) difficult (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah i was gonna say i heard (laughs) some extra audio there and then hold on (laughs) (laughs) so your chances uh, your chances of logosing out the what you want in a wife and getting that are zilch and nil. Sure. Right. Yes. And I, and I, I think Jordan Peterson would agree. Oh, surely he would. Okay. And you know, it's not so much that I think he would disagree with me. I don't think he disagrees with me. Um, But, but by the same token, he's not a Jungian. Okay, he's not right. A, he specifically a, says a Jungian would say this. He would he'll provide the Jungian perspective when it's when it's yeah, fits. And, and sometimes what he says is fine, and sometimes it's a little sketchy. But okay, but, I mean when 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 Jordan Peterson says that the most the most frightening book he ever read is Ion, uh, which is researches into the phenomenology of the self by Carl Jung, right? Um, to him, that's the scariest book in the world. Um, but to me, it it just says the way life is. Okay, so that my favorite. Uh, go look this up. Yeah, if you're if you're in my Dropbox, you can uh, you can get all the collected works on electronic form on my Dropbox. So. Sure. Um, So if you're not on it, just let me know and I'll put you in the Dropbox and then you can get the collected work. So go to volume uh, nine, two, it's nine small II of the collected works and that's ION. And in there go to paragraph 63. And that, that clearly sums up what we're talking about because, um, and he sums it up in one sentence. I mean, when I when I read it finally, I I should read it to you since sure. I have it right here, but I have to reach for it. No worries. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, paragraph sixty-three. It has it all in in sort of one sentence. And and this is this is where I separate from Jordan. Okay, so he's talking about three archetypes. He says the shadow, the syzygy, and the self are psychic factors of which an adequate picture can be formed only on the basis of a fairly thorough experience of them. Um, another, it's like describing the wife you want and. and Putting that together <laughs> in one a wish list. Yeah, right. like a Build-A-Bear. Yeah, that doesn't right, seem like it'll yeah. work. Okay, so just as these concepts arose, um, can you save the printing until after we're done? <laughs> I was going to say, I think I hear it sounds like a fax printer or something yeah. coming out. Um, so um, just as these concepts arose out of an experience of reality, so they can be elucidated only by further experience. Philosophical criticism, which is all logos, rationality, philosophical criticism will find everything to object to in them unless it begins by recognizing 
that they are concerned with facts and that the concept is simply an abbreviated description or definition of these facts. So then here's, here's the kick, kicker. Such criticism has a, as little effect on the object as zoological criticism on the duck-billed platypus. It is not the concept that matters. The concept is only a word, a counter, and it has meaning and use only because it stands for a certain sum of experience. Mm. Okay. And, and so that's, that's the distinction there that um, logos is about physical facts and eros is about experience. Okay. So, you know, you better have an experience, an experience of a woman after you think she meets all your all your characteristics. Yeah, right. You better have an experience with her of right. some sort, or you might choose poorly. <laughs> yeah, otherwise it's otherwise it's back to the porn, like Paul Vanderclay said, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, and I guess so. Well, okay, let, let, let me pose this to you because this is what Jordan Peterson's biggest criticism of Jung is, and I'd like to hear your thoughts. He talks about well, and there's kind of two parts to it. He talks about how Jungian psychology is a, and he, you know, he's operating from a clinical setting. Jungian psychology works for people who are very high in openness and who are more intuitive, like I'd say you and I, and I think that's why we gravitate towards it, gravitate mm -hmm. towards that. But for other people, a more strictly behaviorist approach works. And so I guess, I guess I, there's two, well, we can start with this one because I can bring the other one up later. But I guess the question is, do you think, Jungianism and the philosophy that Jung espouses is obviously it encompasses total, you know, a lot of universal truths. But I mean, do you think it's do you think that Jung is like is the person who has who has the firmest grasp on the truth about life and reality? The, the he provides the closest approximation for everybody, or do no. you think that perhaps it fits no, certain I, personality I, types? Okay, so. Um... I'm not necessarily going to go there, but let's talk first about Jordan. Jordan is a clinical psychologist, okay? And so he's faced all kinds of issues with people clinically. And um, I, read, I readily acknowledge that, you know, there's some things that can be addressed clinically um, using other psychological approaches. And right. And uh, a Jungian approach is not necessarily the end all be all because it takes a long time um, usually sure. to dig down into the depths of a of another human being. Well, and it's and it's abstract and literary often. And like I have friends who like Jordan Peterson for the practical psychology and you know business advice, so to speak, or not sure. business advice, okay. but the very practical but, elements. But, but that's very different from um, Jordan is now a case in point, though, about um, how all that can go off the rails. OK, because he what did, what did he do? He got himself drug addicted. And it's not because he was a bad man. He, he wasn't, um, you know, he certainly knows what drugs can do and so on. And um I think he, you know, probably did it on the advice of somebody else, but not. But he discounted um, the the addictive characteristics of right. the drug Physical he was dependency. taking, yeah, such that that it almost killed him. Okay, and and so, um, you know, there there's nothing that's an end all be all, and. Um, you know, so if we talk, I, I look, I have, I'm not a mental health professional. I've never taught, taken a course in psychology in my life. And so I'm, so everything that I say is from my hip pocket, but it's based on 34 years of studying Jung. Right. And so I, but I have no doubt in my own mind that, um, that there are things that can be resolved 
in a superficial area or way. And um, without the need for going into dreams and Jungian ideas. Right. Precisely. Sure. However, um, you know, somebody that I respect a lot said to me, well, Jordan Peterson is uh, shallow and one-sided. And what they mean by that is that his psychology, his approach to psychology uh, doesn't go to depth um, in the sense that Jung does. And it, um, it is entirely on the logo side. He doesn't go to the arrow side. You know, he, he calls himself, I'm the savior of the logos. Um, sure. And again, I, and again, I, I just have trouble with that distinction because he, he specifically talks about the need for chaos and the need for avoid stagnation. If you sit in your room all day, that's a pathology of order. You need to get out. You need to take in fear. And to right. me, that seems like okay. more arrows. Right? Yeah, he's trying to, you're right. He's trying to save it, say it. But he's he's um, he's pushing pussyfooting around the issues of religion and spirituality, uh, and so he can't take a step over um, to say he believes in God. Mm -hmm. Okay, now yeah, a lot of people hate him for that. He's we right. weaseling around the question and all that. Yeah. Right. And, and he really gets squirrely when that question comes up. Do you believe right. in God? And, um, you know, the point is the point that Dr. Jung made uh, when he said in response to that question, I have no need to believe. I know. Right. And, and when he said that, I said, oh, I too know, okay? And so what is it I know? And it took me 10 years to work it out and to get it into some sort of logical order, some rational mm -hmm. orders, so that now I know. Um, but I already knew it the first time I heard Jung that, that that's where I was, okay? But Jordan hasn't gotten there yet. And so... I think his reservation is, uh, and it's a fair enough one, which is that as, as Nietzsche said, God is dead and we have killed him. Well, that's what the scientific method did to the God of the 16th century. Right. And, and so, yes, that God is dead. Um, but that doesn't mean that God is dead. That means the God as presented to Western civilization for 2000 years, that conception of God, that, that idea of God is dead. Right. Okay. Uh, and it's dead because, you know, every, every myth in, in the Bible, uh, you can, um, you can deny. Yeah. Uh, rationally dispel. So, well, Jesus yeah. didn't literally feed 5,000 people. It's like, there's more there than just the actual. Yeah, you know. I mean, the the one I, I like to talk about, I, I'm sure he did, but I, I, and I'm sure that happened. But what it meant is something different for, from the way it's presented. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you have 5,000 people at the Sermon on the Mount, and you have... Um, seven fishes and five loaves or whatever it is, and you feed off 5,000. Well, that isn't what he did. What he did was say, hey, everybody's got a picnic with them and you've got food with you. Please share it with your, with your neighbors. So right. It's a moral every, injunction, not a right, recounting right. of a literal. Exactly. Right. And, and another example is Lazarus, uh, his coming from the dead. So, he comes to the home of Mary and Martha and um, everybody's wailing because his friend Lazarus was dead and, and Christ goes in with Mary and Martha and he comes out and they swear that Lazarus lives. Okay. Now did Lazarus walk out of that building? Probably not. 
Okay, but um, what I can tell you from losing loved ones is that uh, when, when they physically die, uh, nothing changes. Okay, in other words, um, they still live here in your heart. Um, they may not be physically here anymore, but you have all the all your memories of them, and and, and their imprint on your psyche, and their imprint on it. They've changed how you behave, and that's part of right, your right. identity. And so, and so that part of them still lives. And so, what I'm sure of is that Lazarus went in and he said to the two women, "Just uh, examine your heart. That Lazarus isn't dead. He's." Mm. Um, you know, this corpse here, that's not Lazarus. La Lazarus isn't there anymore. Lazarus is here in your heart right. now. Right. And I think that the, the Bible is a series of metaphors, sort right. of like that, that implies that knowledge. And I think to the degree that you were saying, like Jordan Peterson has a problem with, well, do I believe in God? It's like, well, what does it mean to take that leap of well, you and, know, and these are so, metaphors versus now these are. So Jordan is a rationalist who can't say that the god that nietzsche declared dead is alive okay fair enough you know that that's the you know the way i say it is nietzsche declared god dead Jung came along in the next generation and showed where god lives and um found the living god where he lives and how he goes about doing the work of the godhead Okay, and I don't know if you've looked at it, but there's, I did a lecture on this about 18 months ago, called uh, Finding the Living God. And uh, so I would recommend that to your followers also. Um, because, um, you know, God isn't out there. He's not a puppet master. I mean, Jordan likes likes to talk about Pinocchio and the puppet master, right, as as his metaphor. But God is not a puppet master. Okay, if you're going to get a touch touchdown in a football game, it's not because God is going to reach reach sure. down and push you across the goal. Right. Line. That, I don't think that's his implication in those in that metaphor ever. His, his point is. In, in order to be free of the strings of culture and other people pointing on you, you have to embody, you know, you have to integrate your conscience. You have to, I think, so in, in your language is like, bring arrows so, into your life, yeah, like bring so, chaos. Don't be a, well, a puppet. You no, know, understand that your life is in chaos. You're, mm. you, you live in the arrows and some of it is chaotic to the extent that you have no control over it which is the implication of chaos, mm -hmm. but most of it is in your control because we have learned, we've been to school, we know how to handle the things that could cause our life to be chaotic. Right, right. Yeah. And we exist in a culture that keeps a lot of it at bay, right. which, which this, was, this was the second thing I wanted to, to ask you. Mm -hmm. Peterson's biggest criticism of Jung specifically is that, and he talks about it in his new book, is that Jung and Freud and the psychoanalysts in general did not take into account the degree to which your internal organization of your psyche, your sanity, is dependent upon a functional social system. He says that Jung and Freud and the psychoanalysts believed that if you just got your internal psychic world together, you would ultimately, that would be the key to individuation. And Peterson's point is, well, that you only exist as a organized psyche if the social structure you inhabit is at least functional because you can't, you can't be sane in a, in a, in a, um, you know, in a yeah, chaotic I think, world. I think it's a distinction without a difference. I mean, as I've said, uh, Jordan Peterson about 99.5% of the time, I agree with him. Okay. Um, I don't happen to agree with him about, his religious formulation, not because he can't say, I believe in God, um, because I think when he's saying that, he's, he's thinking, I have to believe in that God, mm. that God that we've been sold for sure, the last right, 2,000 right, right, right. years, mm -hmm. and, and I'm with him, 
on that. I can't believe in that God either. And, and neither have, has Western humanity been able to believe it for, um, you know, at least 500 years, uh, at least the rational side of Western humanity. Right. Okay. Uh, and that God entirely fell apart um, in our, in our psyche. But that doesn't mean that, that some sort of religion isn't important. Some sort of spiritual truth isn't important. Sure. And, and so, you know, you, in my estimation, we each have to make, uh, we each create our own God. In other words, uh, God didn't make us in his image. We make him in our image. Right. And, well, I, I, I think that comes, I think that comes to bear and specifically, you know, in the last few decades, this is a point that others have brought up is like, you know, we, we, we cut out that sort of religious substructure. We cut out these myths going back to the very beginning. When I asked you the question about, right. you know, people having panic attacks and stuff because that <clears throat> re- the religious language they would use to describe it is now gone. Right. So then people turn to their own they don't even know their religions. They follow things without like politics, I think is becoming sort of a lot of people's major religion, especially. Right. And I think it's, well, now it's certainly both it's on the, both the right and the left in that mm-hmm. people on the right get possessed <clears throat> by the archetype of the wise King. Our country is beautiful. Make America great. And, you know, we have this country that needs to be protected. And then on the left, it's the opposite. It's our country is purely evil. We need to destroy it. And it's like, People are being possessed by two different archetypes and that serves as their religious religion. And then they operate in those contexts and in their day-to-day right. lives, they'll, they'll, and, and they'll both, attack their friends and family based on this religious idea rather than keep right. that as a separate that, that's thing. The, that's the devil's trick. Right. And, and from my perspective, having served my whole life around the armed forces is that, at, that America is yes we're flawed but we're way better than anybody else right right and what's the Churchill in, quote it's like capitalism or what or western democracy is the worst government except for all the other ones or something right like that. and and uh, americans always get the right answer after trying everything else sure right right <laughs> right. right and and so um you know the our diversity is our strength and our debate is our strength. It's a, it's a process like tempering steel where, you know, and and when you're tempering steel, you're pounding all the, all the impurities out of the steel, you heat it up, get it as hot as you can pound the crap out of it. And the impurities come out. And the more you do that, the tougher the steel becomes until you have a Japanese katana. And, and uh, that's, that's the hardest steel on earth. Um, and, um, and so our country is like that. We, we make, you know, gargantuan mistakes, but um, we learn from our mistakes and move on. And, you know, and it's not something that you can rational out. You can't, right? You can't say, "Oh, the guys at, on January 6th were wrong." It, it's not like they were wrong. It, it's like, um, you know, they they got a certain idea in their heads, and unfortunately, some of them are going to suffer the consequences of, of the impurity in those ideas. Right. They thought they were protecting the country. They thought they were saving. <clears throat> they, were, they were the patriots. Right. And, and uh, you know, the rest of us are going to say, no, <laughs> you know, that isn't the way it works. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, um, and they didn't really, know what they wanted i mean they got into the chambers of congress and they didn't know what to do they were at at a total loss what to do um and yeah yeah they get it yeah because they were just playing out a a a game right and they they saw a scenario and and they thought uh 
the president have their back and he didn't. Okay. Right. And, um, and so, you know, but, but they're still Americans. And if they, you know, if they go to a jail for six months or a year or five years or 10 years, depending on what, what they get charged with, uh, they're still going to be my fellow Americans mm -hmm. um, when they come out. And, and so. Well, and I, I think I'm like that attitude is, the, you know, the attitude you like is one of sort of forgiveness. I think that's missing a lot. I think the way I like to think about it, and you tell me what you think is like, we should view our country the same, like we should view our country and our country's history the same way we would view, you know, a loved one or a family member's personal life and their history. It's like, or look at yourself. It's like, should you only, should you like, just our country has a history of bloodshed and a history of, of good things as well. Yeah. It's both. And so, and just like every person has a history of ter doing terrible things and doing good things as well. It's like, you have to acknowledge the darkness in your past but to pretend that that is the only reality and that defines you, like that's, that's self-hatred. And then to do that for your country and say, well, our country has such a dark past. This is what defines us. It's like, you have to love your country as you would, you love a person or yourself and still acknowledge that darkness. And that's the way to approach it healthily and say, look, no, we have our flaws and we still have our systemic problems and our history proves it, but we also have the capacity to grow and overcome. And I think that that's a, that's a more whole complete story of combining sure. the and, darkness and the good. You know, I've had friends say uh, to me, and I did serve in Vietnam, um, that they felt guilty because they didn't serve in Vietnam. And I, I said, well, you should put that out of your mind because I went so you didn't have to. And, and uh, you know, that's exactly one of the reasons that I went. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, wasn't because I thought I was courageous and they were wimps, not at all. Um, you know, somebody had to do it and, and that, that was my way, but it's not necessarily the, the way for everyone. And, right. and so if I hadn't been there, someone else would have had to do it. And, and so you know, if, if everything's about thumping your chest and saying, oh, look how great I am. Okay, well, I had a, a shootout on, on uh, responses on one of my videos where uh, I had said that we, we give away too many um, participation awards you know, everybody gets a trophy. I think that's thing, accurate. Yeah. Right. And, and he said, Oh, we don't do that. And I said, yes, we do. We do it all the time, everywhere. Just mm -hmm. look around. And so I said, I pointed out that nearly every decoration on er any military individual is a participation award. Okay. And uh, right up to the, right up to the fact of my bronze star. I have a bronze star with a V for valor on it, but I didn't get it for heroism. I got it for my meritorious service. And so, so, you know, I said, look, that was a participation award for me being a first lieutenant in Vietnam. Um, but it, it's, it's not really, you know, it's not glory. Mm. I mean, although a lot of people want to go around and beat their chest that it's glory. Yeah. Well, you show me somebody with a Navy cross or a congressional medal of honor, mm -hmm. and then I'll think it's glory right. or even a silver star, but, but, you know, anything bronze star and below is basically you get the award for uh, doing Being your in job. the campaign or something. Yeah. Doing right. your job. And, you know, in the military, we, after 90 days, we give everybody a national defense service medal. Well, that's a participation award. Interesting. Right. And interesting. What, so the, so the, 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 the meme or the joke of we give everyone participation awards and how that affects people goes all the way up to the military. Even 
Absolutely. Sure. And, and, you know, just, I don't know if you watch the funeral of Prince Philip, but behind the, behind the altar, there were all these ribbons and sashes and all sorts of shit that he had. And, you know, so here's a guy who was a Lieutenant commander in the British Navy and he had been given command of a ship that was home ported in Malta. It was in peacetime. It was it, it wasn't during uh, the Suez crisis of 1956. Sure. It was before his wife had risen to the crown. And so he didn't get those awards because he was any br- this brave uh, naval officer, right? And you know, by the time he died, he had, he was like fleet admiral or something like that. Well, he did, he never did squat after sure. he, he had this ship right. out of Malta, right? Yep. And so, so it was all participation awards for him. Interesting. Yeah. He, yeah. he, he just happened to he just happened to be married to the queen. So right. Okay. Oh yeah. Like connections. Interesting. Yeah. And so, um. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So, and we're coming up, I think on, um, on a good time to stop. I want to ask you this final question. Um, so like I said, I think when I look at the demographics of my YouTube channel, I get the analytics and I can see the age range and it's mostly 18 to 30 in that range. Mine too. Um, Right. Right. So I want to ask based on your own experiences and based on your understanding of what Jung might say, what advice would you give to someone at the beginning of their life, 18 to 30 in that range of flux? Certainly for me, it's been a time of like flux, but doing this YouTube channel, kind of figuring out what I'm trying to do. What is your understanding of, you know, what, what's the best advice going forward or for someone in that range? Um, Make mistakes, make as many mistakes as you can, as fast as you can. Mm. Um, I used to ask people, um, in employment interviews, what's the biggest mistake you ever made? Because it's a real truth teller. Mm. If, if they claim some tiny little mistake, then you know they're a liar. And uh, if, if they say a big mistake and describe it, then uh, you understand that they, they're maybe a mature human being that might not rob you and so on. Right? And, and so... Um, you know, we learn through our mistakes, actually. And, um, and so, I mean, that is the biggest thing, but, you know, get into life, get a life, um, you know, do something, you know, mm-hmm. don't sit in your mother's basement and do video right. games. Go out into the world, like, like Abraham being called from his tent to go out in the world. Yeah, go forth and and multiply, but right. you know, get get called into life by a woman. Okay, get married. Um, you know that that's the traditional way because then then you have to mature because all of a sudden you got a kid or three, mm-hmm. and and uh, you have to face the realities of what that means, and so. Um, but in order to do that make the mistakes early so you can develop. Well, I mean, you're, you're going to have the most successful life if you make the mistakes early. Right. Quite frankly. Interesting. That's, op- that's, that's optimistic. And, I think. Well, it is. Especially for. And, and I tend to be a, uh, the glass, glass is half full for me. So I tend to be an optimist, but the point is what, whatever it is, just find something and start doing it. And, um, you know, you may be a miserable failure at it, but but then the next thing comes along. And, you know, I put, I started doing visioning, which is one of the things they tell you to do in self-help books. And so I was visioning, okay, I want to be a general in the Marine Corps, and I want to build this house on my old farm and a bunch of other things that I was visioning doing. But, you know, oh, oh, by the way, boom, I broke my leg and that wasn't happening anymore. At least Mm -hmm. the general in the Marine Corps wasn't happening anymore. Right. And um, and so 
then then the question is okay if you're an oak tree that just got its limb cut off to allow a power line or telephone line what are you going to do well you have to put a new shoot out and you have to start doing something else and so the reason you and i are here right now is because about 15 years ago i realized that Jung had been my shrink, okay? He had, he had been my advisor over a period of about 20 years at that point. And I wanted to share that because I, I've had real success in real businesses. I founded a company on my back porch that went public. Um, and um, I'm still involved in a company that's going to do something really amazing um and it's it's based on golden threads you have to know what a golden thread is so um let's see if i can just quickly show you but um in 2002 i met a gentleman in um riyadh saudi arabia I met a man in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and he um, had a business. And at one point he um, needed some help. And uh, he called me up and said, uh, Skip, can you send me $50,000? And I said, okay, I'll do it. And so I sent him $50,000 cash on nothing else no papers, no terms, nothing. This man asked me for this money and I sent it to him. Um, and now that was in 2003 about that that happened. And I, by that time I had known him for about a year and a half. And uh, since then uh, we've interacted regularly in various ways. And so I'm um, just going to share my screen here. Sure. Um, and and so here you go. So this is that gentleman, kind of guessing in Kathir Kama, Kama Tambi. And here's me. Right. Um, this man is was uh, the treasurer of Infosys, which was the first Indian company to go public on the New York Stock Exchange. And this man has been one of the designers of the software that we have that has been with him all that time. And so as you see in this set of screens here um i'm the only token white guy <laughs> okay. you're the diversity hype <laughs> uh, yeah i'm the diversity guy so what uh, does the company do well um let's see if we have the have, let me see what we have on the home page because um I, I don't know what we're quite prepared to announce yet but sure. um um, okay, news. It must be in news, I guess. Okay, so three weeks ago, we signed a memorandum of understanding with uh, Mitsubishi. Um, to uh, do our um, center for uh, international center for uh, pandemic preparedness it's called the international pandemic preparedness center and um, to do it in like third world lower income countries uh, around the world mm. and um you know, fundamentally, very simply, what it does 
uh, is it goes on um, social media and using artificial intelligence, it, it can actually tell you within 400 meters if you have uh, dengue fever, let's say, or um, if you have uh, COVID. Interesting. And, and so on. So, um, so that's one of the things it does. It also does everything you can do in a hospital with a computer to include not only health records, which is what comes to mind for everyone, but also um, all the personnel work to include all the certifications of uh, doctors and nurses and whether they're up to snuff on their, on their certifications, uh, all of their um, you know, vacations and everything, all their salary and all that. Sure. And uh, finance, and you're talking about supply chain management, the average hospital has 50,000 items in inventory, mm -hmm. five zero thousand. Right. And my friend, uh, Kana and his team uh, went into, i just give you an example, went into uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital, Jetta, which is a a branch of King Faisal Specialist Hospital. And when I started to work with them, they were the largest hospital between Athens and Singapore, okay? Um, and uh, so we went in there and, and uh, they thought they had 3000 drugs in their pharmacy and kind of put his system in and did all the data entry necessary. And what he found was that uh, of the 3,000 drugs that they thought they had, uh, 1,000 that they, did, they didn't have at all, and uh, about 1,100 of them uh, were expired. And so they only had like 900 drugs that were actually Interesting. usable. Right. A hospital's primary core competence is not inventory planning. Right. Okay, so that and so that's just that's just you know uh, narcotic drugs, right? And, and so um, you know, as you can imagine, a hospital has has uh, you know light bulbs for the operating room and all kinds of mm -hmm. other things. Sure, yep, the and, MRO, and it's about fifty thousand items, and so we have a supply chain management system for that. Nice, and so in twenty seventeen kind of sold the software that we had put together over many years uh, to a public company um, for $50 million, five zero million. Okay. <laughs> and, so that was a good $50,000 investment then. Right. And, um, and then uh, he had to sit out a three hour or a three year uh, non-compete and um then after he worked for the company for three years and sat this out, um, he left the company and they stopped paying him royalties. So presumably that was because after that three year period, they'd figured out how to do most of the stuff that was in our software mm. um, themselves. And so they stopped paying royalties, which was part of the 50 million. And so we took it back and it's right here over my shoulder. Nice. And so the, the company, one of the uh, now three companies that I'm president, president of in North America owns that software. And um, so it's, uh, it has the potential of being something big. Sure. But, but all of that um, was made possible by a golden thread which is relationship, which is eros, which is the feminine side of the equation. You know, if, it, if I'd been totally logos, I would have written, written a, mm -hmm. a document this thick and had somebody had him sign it. I, I had a lesson when I, in 1980, I, when I went to Japan to start a company, uh, the guy who was running Singapore at the time was also responsible for Taiwan. And so he invited me to go to Taiwan with him because, among other things, the 34-year-old general counsel of the 
company we were working for had written a document like that. And he wanted all the agents around the world to sign it. And so Tom was very apprehensive about this, but he wanted he had to go in and talk to our our agent in Taiwan. And so we went to Tainan actually. And Tom did a, about an hour pre-see pre on signing this document. And then he very, um, very carefully, gingerly pulled it out of his briefcase and hands it over to our colleague in Tainan. And he says, um, Frank Shi, who was the who was the agent, um, grabbed it and he said, Oh, you want me to sign this? Fine. He signs it, <laughs> throws it back at Tommy, and he says, You know, this doesn't mean anything. <laughs> All that prep work. Right. And the point, the point is that in international business, uh, you're never going to sue somebody. Okay. And because sure. How you take him to the world court? Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> and you can't sue in the local court. You're never going to succeed. Right. You know, it's just like my foreclosure action that I was fighting for 10 years. Um, you know, you can't succeed in that. And in that case, I couldn't succeed because if they let me succeed, then the whole financial industry of the United States would fall would apart. Collapse. Right. Even though I wasn't wrong, I was right. Um, and, and so in that Taiwan case, you know, you're never going to go to Taiwan to sue somebody, uh, because you can't and, or you're not going to win. And, um, uh, you know, so now let's talk about Saudi Arabia and you're going to go right. to Saudi Arabia and sue somebody. Yeah, good, good luck, luck, you know? Right. right, right and, right. um, and so, um, lesson learned is take the golden thread and don't, uh, yeah logify have a, everything have a relationship with somebody right you know right. and and you know one of the things that i total totally respect about my partner is that uh about a decade ago he gave his kidney to his wife okay she was dying from a kidney malfunction and he donated his kidney to her uh so because he has two or he had two and so he gave her one and it, it worked and she's still alive and, mm. and living happily ever after. And actually is one of the people in those pictures I was showing you. And, sure, 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 sure. And so the point is many of the people that were in those pictures, I've known for almost 20 years. And, um, and so, you know, w will it, come to a fruition that will be a huge payout for me someday well it might uh and it also might not but um you you're never going to do something like that unless you have a golden thread mm -hmm. and a relationship with someone so right. so you you can say okay i've got this contract and god damn it if you're not going to do x i'm going to take you to court well you know fine good luck um and maybe you'll win you know, in the United States, you might win. Okay. Mm -hmm. And lots of people do that. But in the end, um, in international business, if you don't have relationships with people, you're never going to do anything. Uh, right. And uh, if you, if you go in guns blazing and, you know, criticize somebody, say, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do something, I'm going to disrupt your company or something like that. You're never going to do it in court, but you might be able to disrupt somehow. Uh, but, you know, if you do that sort of shit, you're done, you know. Right. Take the soft-handed approach. <laughs> right. Right. And so, that, so, you know, that's the way I've always operated. And I've always operated with a company like a family mm. that, that you have to... Um, respect everybody and deal with everybody and right um, look at it through arrows yeah and and you know the problem we have with mbas now I, do you have an mba i, I do not but okay. i know people around my age are starting to pursue them right okay but but what we've done by training uh 
two generations of MBAs to follow the statistical method is we've created generations of psychopaths, um, literally. Mm. <laughs> and well, I'd hope uh, not literally, not literally out. No, literally. People. Oh, literally. Okay. I mean, that's what caused the the 2008 crash. Mm, look at I the mean, numbers, however, you know, I, manipulate the numbers. We, we could spend another whole session mm -hmm. and, and I could give you a pressy about that. But, but the point is that, um, you know, you can't decide anything by a qu quarterly set of numbers. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, but that's the way we've taught MBAs to do it. So I, I took, you know, the Chicago School MBA, which is, um, you know, the Milton Friedman approach, and it's all statistics. Okay, so that's all logos, absolutely all. And so I, my MBA is 15 courses in statistics by different names. And after I left the business school, I never ran a regression analysis, not a single time, never even thought of doing it. And I've been doing successful business in Japan, India, and Saudi Arabia, and many other countries over the years. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, those those three are the big ones. But sure, um, yeah, I know Elon Musk says we have an MB. I think it's he says an MBAification of business, specifically that it's people mm -hmm. looking at numbers and stuff, quarterly reports. Uh, you know, Jordan Peterson talks about you know, five centuries ago, you'd have people start on a cathedral that they know aren't, isn't going to get finished in 150 years. Right. And we look at quarterly reports. And if it doesn't have a return in 10 years, well, the people, the shareholders at the time are going to be retired at that point. And they don't want to see it past yeah. 10 years. So, right. So, yeah. I mean, that's the essence of it. Jordan's right about that. Um, and, and so, you know, we have to change our perspectives on lots of things, but oh yeah. Um, but one of the things is we have to change our perspectives about God and what God is, and not whether you believe in God, but whether you grok what God is. Right. How you, you should grok act. it. You're going to be all right. Right. Cool. Well, I think this is a good place to stop, Skip. Okay. Um, I very much well. appreciate it. What's that? <laughs> Where are you at? No, 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 no. It's good. We've got plenty of content. I like to do, uh, I like to do clips on my podcast. So yeah, I'll, do whatever I'm gonna, you so like. yeah, I'm going to take this, cut it up. I'll definitely put the whole thing on my, uh, what do you call it? The, it's called anchor or whatever. It's a cloud thing. And then I'll get little snips or whatever. Cause those end up, cause we can do it topic by topic, which I think right. is. So really send good. me, send me a, a link or two when you, when you sure. do it. So yes. I know yes. you look at it when it's ready. Yes, absolutely. Um, normally what I do is I just put the whole thing out. And right. I, my, cause and I know you've got what's like 13,000 subscribers or something like that. Almost 14,000. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm at 560 right now. So right. I have to be very careful with, you know, get, get, tailoring the stuff to a specific, you know, audience and getting the bits out or whatever. Yeah. But, um, but I mean, well, people, I, at the beginning, I was doing the same thing you're doing, but I found that people really do like the longer format. Sure. And, and yeah. so you might want to do both. You might want to put one out as a long format and, and then also chop it up. Yeah, I do. I, I, like I told you, I do. I'll do videos of just me monologuing and then I do a bunch of edits and I put visuals over and stuff for some of the topics. Like yeah. I did one on Jordan Peterson explains the archetypes in fiction and why mm -hmm. we like you were, and you said in, in this conversation, Jack and Jill going up a hill. That's not an archetype. You know, who cares? It's like it needs yeah. to draw on the archetypes for power and stuff. So I like that, yeah. too. And then I'm, I'm slowly mixing in the podcast and stuff. And as I do it. I like to think of it as earning my audience's trust. Then I can oh, yeah. put out a, you know, a two no, hour that's, thing. That we that's can fine. Work. You do it any way you want to. Yes. And, uh, you know, I'll pull something together in the next couple of days. I'll, I'll cut out the beginning where, where you were talking about things you didn't know. Sure. Sure. Yes. No. Right. Um, and, um, and I'll, I'll also publish it. And so what would I send people to, if I was going to send people, what what's the what's your YouTube channel? It's PF Young. It's my it's on the bottom left of my screen on Zoom. Yeah, PF J U N G, which is by the way, that's 
a pseudonym, Carl Jung. It's my initials, yeah. Paul Falar, and then Jung. Yeah. Understood. So. It's, it's pfjung.com. Or, uh, uh, YouTube uh, channel is called PF Jung. So okay, if you just type in PF Jung in the search bar, it'll show okay. up. All right. But uh, PF Jung YouTube channel. Okay. Yes. So, I, and so I, I've got some stuff on, I was going to say back order. I'm thinking of supply chain stuff. I got stuff on backlog. So I'll probably, I, I have a couple more clips to release, but I'll start dropping the clips over the next week or two. Okay. And then I'll, uh, I'll have the full thing up in a link and then see where I can go. From yeah. There. But, I'm, you know, I'm happy to do this with you or anyone else uh, anytime. I'm- yes. Well, and, and I think, and like I said, as I go down the line and I get more deep into you, know, I think it'd be cool to iron out maybe because today, today was kind of an overview when we got the whole story, but if we want to talk about specific ideas where it's like, let's right, right. really sure. in depth, think about, well, what does this archetype mean and how does this relate and stuff? Cause there's definitely okay. stuff we can talk about, but. Okay. Well, that'd, that'd be good. And, um, I, I learned something about art this weekend, which is um, the best way to be an artist of any kind, whatever it is, mm-hmm. is uh, don't don't focus on being being an artist. Teach other people to be an artist, be artists, but have your art where you're teaching them. <laughs> sure, and, be the example. Draw be them the to example it. and draw them to it, and then they are going to buy your art sure uh, interesting that's absolutely true interesting sure and and um so um you know the difference in in following is when i came upon my friend uh, tim holmes um he had put up a video in 2010 and it had 100 hits and um I've, I've changed his perspective quite a bit, and I did a, a nude posing session. Right, with him the right. We day. talked about that. Yeah, right. sans persona. Right, sans persona, and uh, it's had almost five hundred hits since <laughs> since Tuesday. It's <laughs> a market for it. <laughs> That's yeah, funny. People have that period of interest. All right. Quick, quick question. Do you, do you get, you, you got your, you have your analytics on your channel, right? You can look at like watch time oh, yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah, sure. What is for, for like a, just out of, for a two hour, you know, video you have, cause I know you got some that are like three hours. What's mm. the, what's the percentage of people that will watch all the way through? Is, cause mine are usually oh, around 10 or something like that. Yeah. Between five and 10, more like yeah. 5% that'll watch right. all the way through. Right. But, but, it hops but up through the beginning, you know, YouTube, yeah. YouTube, their sweet spot is if you have a 10 minute video or if people stay on for 10 minutes on your video. Mm -hmm. And um, so on my, uh, on a lot of my longer videos, I have an average of between 10 and 20 minutes. Right. Which that's more important than the percentage. Right. And, and, but what also you see is that, more than half will leave in less than one minute. And oh yeah. So That's it, all of mine. Cause right. they click it. And then, and I do the same thing when I'm watching videos, I noticed that I'll go, sure. here's someone I'll go, this isn't, I'll move on to the next one or I'll see another thumbnail pop up. Right. And, and so the fact that you hold people's interest for a long period of time is noteworthy. Yes. Definitely. Right. And, uh, but don't expect that everybody's going to stay probably sure. 50 50 or 60 percent will be gone in less than 30 seconds right right and, right and the rest uh in order for that to average up to 10 or 20 minutes then you have to have people that are staying for an hour right 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 and um so my average is running in the neighborhood of between 10 and 20 minutes now definitely uh, which is good and you know right. i have a lot of uh, a close group that come to my uh, advanced reading group i don't publish right. that on youtube mm. um but but you know they they're very loyal now these people sure yeah and that's something you know i posted my first videos for my friends like i posted on facebook primarily yeah. and that's who would see it and now it's grown a bit to you know i'll post it to reddit or something i've i've i get regular comments from people who i've never met before someone's in ireland or amsterdam or something like that and it's like well, now, now I'm not just talking as I would to my friends. It's like, I'm actually, I got to step it up in a sense of like, you know, I'm, I'm reaching an audience. Well, they're interested what, in the ideas. Yeah. So I, I urge you to start 
groups, uh, Zoom groups, for example, mm -hmm. where you can um, actually live stream the group. And that's what I do now. Sure. I, I just live stream and, um, and then I, I'm not really editing very much. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think it. definitely... My goal is when I hit a thousand subscribers yeah. to kind of make an announcement of like, this is where I want to take the channel. I'm going to do more live stuff. Maybe I think Twitch, are you familiar with Twitch? It's a streaming yeah. thing. So I, I was considering doing, watching Jordan Peterson lectures live and taking and making comments and doing commentary on them oh, or, or cool. Twitch. So yeah. a bunch of different niches I could go down, but yeah. But I mean, that's how you attract people. So now, um, you know, I have 35,000 or so twitter followers now oh really yeah oh wow i didn't know that i'll have and to follow you skip underscore conover skip underscore conover Hold on. right and um yeah so, where did that where did those come from because you got more well, of them on your youtube they came uh, most of them came back in 2013 12 2013 when i was involved in a in a play in um in turkey and um, it it's a play about a dystopian society, but it, it's not any society on earth. And um, so we, we did this play 25 times with about um, 15,000 people who came to the, to the theater in, um, in Istanbul and 27,000 people that came to... Um, uh, came to the live stream. So we live streamed it 25 times. Interesting. Wow. So I'll just show you a picture of it. So the essence of the play is that it, it is a country. And in this picture, you see the president of the country who's up on a podium giving a speech. And it's done in like a hockey rink. And so the other end of the hockey rink has a piano. And the two key characters are the president of the country and this piano person who's playing the piano for tips. And what you see on the wall there is my part in the play, which is my friends asked me to provide the, well, it's odd for Turkey, but provide the Greek chorus. So, so I listened to the live stream every time we performed, and then I ran the Twitter feed. Mm -hmm. and, and I ran the Twitter feed in 20 different personas. And, and so I kept logging on and logging off Twitter and different names. Right? Interesting. But including in my own name. And so uh, I had agreed to do this Twitter feed but it wasn't until the fourth performance that I realized that they were projecting it on the wall of the theater. <laughs> <laughs> and, nice. And so the upshot of it was, and this is on my, uh, my website, uh, Archetype in Action, um, under questions, uh, I, um, you know, we performed it 20, 25 times and th about six weeks after the last performance was Gezi Park and the Turkish government decided that they were going to blame us for being a rehearsal for Gezi Park. And so the result of that was that um, ultimately my playwright and actor friends and one person from the organization um, became... Um, exiles and they now live in the uk wow and they've they've all been indicted for murder um and uh, in turkey and so the uk won't extradite them because they they know it's it's a it's a crock but probably i'm persona non grata in turkey so sure. we, yeah you won't be going to turkey anytime soon no i'm not going to go back to turkey <laughs> But I did wow. go. I've been there sure. uh, three times, and I actually performed in the theater one time, and uh, I actually did my work in the theater with with the whole crew, which was wow, lots of that's fun. cool. But you know, you, it, it's like um, the Sorcerer's 
apprentice in Fantasia. Do you remember that scene? Mm, no, I don't okay. think so. Where the wizard, the wizard uh, leaves his wand uh, to his apprentice, the the sorcerer's apprentice. So the apprentice starts to play with it, and he he gets brooms to do his work and carry water for the wizard. And but pretty soon the brooms get out of hand, and and uh, they start filling up the place with water and it, it becomes a flood. And then, so um, then the wizard comes back and you, you should look it up on YouTube. Sure, sure. It's, it's there. It's, it's Fantasia. Fantasia Sorcerer's Apprentice. Right. And um, so anyway, the this, this sorcerer comes back and he takes the wand and he pushes it aside. So right. be, before, we, before we did that play, we were sorcerers apprentices, but now we're right. past, past masters. Sure. Sorcerers. <laughs> nice. nice.